Hello, everyone. My name is Corey Kramer. I am the creator of the webcomic Wonder Weenies. It can be found at www.wonderweenies.com. Updates every Tuesday and Thursday. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a graduate of the Kubert School of, of Art. I'm going to just simplify it like that because I'm sure he'll tell me the, the proper name eventually. But he is a cartoonist, a, a very talented cartoonist at that, uh, of the superhero genre, among other things as well, too. We're joined today by the ever-talented Corey Kramer. How are you doing today, Corey? I am doing well, thank you. Hopefully you're doing the same. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and, and what you do. Well, like you said, uh, my name's Corey Kramer. I am from Minnesota, and I currently am the creator of uh, Wonder Weenies. It's a webcomic. I update it every Tuesday and Thursday. It's about a group of former fast food workers that gain superpowers after being exposed to radioactive hot dogs. I originally came up with the idea, I wanted to do a newspaper strip, which is uh, the whole reason why I decided to apply for Jill Kubert. Unfortunately, uh, you know, that's not really an option anymore. It was hard enough to get a newspaper strip when they were a viable thing, and, and now forget it. My timing rather sucked. I got accepted to the Joe Hubert School back in 93, which was great. It was a great time for the industry then. And three years later, when I graduated, it was 96, which was not a good time for the industry. And I have a cartoony style to boot. It wasn't in the cards for me for a little while. I spent a long time actually working with troubled teenagers of all things. I worked in many treatment centers and difficult, difficult work. It was uh, great to help them, but eventually it just got to my mental health and I just, I, I had to get out of it again. And I decided to um, pursue cartooning again. I took over as the artist for a webcomic called Remedy. That could also be found at the website Wonder Weenies. There's a, there's a link if anyone feels like checking out Remedy. I'm very proud of the work I did on Remedy. Business partner Rob Tracy wrote Remedy. I got the idea for Wonder Weenies. I created Wonder Weenies originally because uh, the first comic strip idea I came up with was based on my high school drama department. I basically flipped a coin back in high school to either go into acting or become a cartoonist. I came up cartoonist. Lucky me, I guess. I was uncomfortable with that strip because I didn't want syndicates to have rights to characters based on people I knew. I came up with the Wonder Weenies idea. Originally, it was going to be a superhero team with all the members from different restaurants. I changed that premise because I found that as I was creating characters, I, I didn't like that they were seeming to be stereotypical, like Chinese character, Mexican character. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just I, I didn't like the direction it was going. So I, I narrowed it down, picked hot dog theme because I like the alliteration of Wonder Weenies and it, it just went from there. Remedy uh, went on hiatus because Rob decided to go back to school, but Wonderweenies has been going strong. I've had a difficult last couple of years, though, because I've had some health issues. My kidneys failed. I've been on dialysis most of this year. Last year was, was a difficult, well, it was difficult for everybody, obviously, due to COVID and whatnot. You know, having a major health issue hits as COVID hits doesn't make things any easier. There were a few months there last year where I had to go on break just to make sure I was healthy. Well, that's good. I, I, it's amazing to see that you can use the break to be creative, you know, health issues aside, you know, hopefully you're battling as you can with this type of, you know, you're using your comic as a way to at least take your mind away. At least you have a creative outlet. That's a good thing. Not, not many people can say that. Overrated, underrated, very simple. We're going to go the DC edition of overrated, underrated. Right. So it should be something you're, you're very familiar <laughs> with. Now, this is of course your own personal opinion on, on the people that I'll, I will be naming here as well too. Superman, overrated, underrated. You can also say perfectly rated if you so choose. Uh, I think if you take Batman out of the equation, Superman is definitely my favorite superhero. I would have to go underrated with a caveat though, because he's such a difficult character to write. He's Superman. He's perfect. Like, how do, how do you challenge Superman? When he's written well, it's amazing. I mean, some of the best Superman, like, one of the best Superman stories wasn't even Superman's story. It was Clark Kent's story where he was overhearing his neighbor being the victim of domestic abuse and that uh, amazing story. Like, how, what do you do 
you, you can't fly in through the window uh, and stop it. Th stories like that that focus more on the man and less on the super uh, are great. I, I don't like the let's make Superman a dark brooding type. It feels like the, the direction that all comics are going in lately because that's not what he's about. Next superhero then, The Flash. Flash, uh, definitely underrated. On the surface, oh, he's just super fast, whatever. But he's faster than Superman. And, and to be better than Superman at anything, you have to be an under, underrated character. I was a little bothered that due to fan demand, they brought back Barry. I thought he had a really great sacrifice are doing okay things with him now, but when they initially brought him back, I was like, ah, it just takes away from the sacrifice he made. Flash, underrated, I'd say. Green Lantern. You know, I love Green Lantern. I love the concept of Green Lantern. I love how they fixed Green Lantern in the Silver Age. Nothing against the Golden Age Lantern. I love his costume. It's just goofy as all get out, and I love it. I have to go a little bit overrated. I'm still a bit bitter about the whole Parallax thing. They fixed Parallax. But when they initially made Hal Jordan go nuts, yeah, I, w I wasn't a big fan of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they, you know, again, it seemed like let's make a guy go evil just to get some readers in. And eventually it worked out. But my initial reaction, I, I just, mm, I think he was a little too easily forgiven for that. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. It's a tough one because she she's iconic in in that she's just such an early important female figure, even though her early appearances are a little not PC anymore. Right now, I like her where she's at. I mean, I'm glad she's getting the attention she's getting. I wasn't crazy about the 1984 movie, but it, it was okay. <laughs> Batman, obviously. I like Batman. Uh, I'm very excited that Batman gets the attention he gets. You know, when it comes right down to it, however unlikely it is, he's like the one superhero that, given the proper circumstances and training, you could be. And, and that's very appealing to me. Plus, you know, you know who he is in silhouette. Uh, how many superheroes can say that? <laughs> <laughs> And, and his uh, rogues gallery is amazing. I mean, he's yeah. great. So then who's the best Batman, top three Batman that played in the films? I mean, Am I allowed to say best. Kevin Conroy? <laughs> oh, <he's totally. laughs> Like I'm a huge Adam West fan too. I, I mean, yeah. a lot of people hate Adam West, but it's like no, for what it was, that's some entertaining stuff. The animated series Batman is one of the best interpretations of the character there's been ever, much less put the film, you know? The, the Nolan movies were a decent uh, interpretation of Batman. Every iteration of Batman has its merits and has bits that aren't great. I'm not going to tell you I enjoyed the Batman and Robin movie. I mean, I get the intent. I mean, he was trying to get the campiness that the 60s show had because there's some appeal to that. It just didn't really work. Don't get me started on... Riddler's one of my favorites. Don't get me started on Jim Carrey's version of the Riddler. Did not like it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Looking at then your longstanding career with this particular comic, do you enjoy the superhero genre as a whole in terms of the world that you've built? Or do you like more comedy? Is Do you like to mix a combination of things when you create and write your comic? Oh, I, I definitely enjoy mixing the two. I mean, I, I'm a huge superhero fan. I, I don't know if you can see some of the Batman collection behind me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe near the end, I can do a quick tour, move the camera around, sure. but always been a big DC fan, Batman in particular. So I love superheroes and, and just the inspiration they give. I, I know superheroes are hot in general right now with Marvel movies and whatnot. I just wish DC could have better movies, but that's a whole other, <laughs> other thing. At least the cartoons are good. I really enjoy doing the humorous stuff. Just writing characters in particular. When I created Wonder I had a big focus on getting the characters down, trying to make their personalities unique enough where I could throw them in any strange, bizarre situation. And I just know 
how they're going to react. I love writing them in that respect. Let's, let's dive into some of your, into the world that you created. How did you come up with this world specifically? Because obviously having a longstanding web comic that you have, a comic that you have, I should say, must have taken a lot of, of time to build the world that you've created. What, what kind of triggered that? Well, it, it, it's very tricky. Because originally I wanted to do newspaper strip, I, I draw my comic in like a newspaper strip style. But I also have, uh, rather than like a, one shot daily gag. I have an ongoing storyline, but I also try and tell a joke every trip, which is really difficult setting that up. From the get go, I decided that if I'm going to do a superhero story, you need to do an origin. So I started one of the main characters, Frank. I started the strip on his first day on the job. I chose a hot dog themed restaurant because very few exceptions. There really aren't any hot dog chains out there. It seemed like I'm not going to step on too many toes if I'm making fun of hot dogs. Like I said, Wonder Weenies is just a fun thing to say. So I started with their first day. And if you read the first month, month and a half worth of strips, it's set up like a slice of life business, uh, working in fast food type comic. And then I turn the whole thing on its head by giving them superpowers and things just get bonkers from there. <laughs> the three main characters, there's Frank. One of my favorite things about Frank is he became a human hot dog hybrid that's got regeneration powers. When he got his powers, got injured, he actually got set on fire and he regenerated, but now he looks like a human hot dog. It's basically indestructible, can't be killed. And one of my favorite things about him is I didn't reveal his name until at least a year into the strip. And the fact that his name is Frank is just very ironic. And you know, yeah. now he's a hot dog. Personally, I just thought that was hilarious. But no, he was great. called by name for, for most of the first run. Uh, then the main female character is Dee. She is a no-nonsense type of gal. Doesn't take anyone's crap, really. <laughs> and calls things like it is, she generates fire. Her powers have evolved a little bit. When I first introduced her powers, all she did was create flames from her hands. Slowly over time, she's become more of a human torch type character, can fly flame on the, the whole bit, but usually she's just creating fire from her hands. And then uh, Murray is the other main character. He has a shape-shifting prehensile mullet. His hair stretches out and he grabs things and makes Green Lantern style fists and things like that. He's probably my favorite character to write because he's just an idiot. Like he's <laughs> the mullet personified. No offense to anyone who might have a mullet, but come on. <laughs> he, he's great. He never calls anyone by the right name. I did a really fun story arc where, um, quick side note, one of my humor influences is comedy music. I've been a Dr. Demento fan, Weird Al, oh, yeah. you name it, for pretty much my entire life. Novelty music is kind of exclusively what I listen to. I'm a big fan of Insane Ian, and he agreed to guest star in the comic. I did a story arc <laughs> with, with Insane Ian, and through the whole thing, Murray never called him by the right name, and it was so much fun. <laughs> so that's the main team, and I just really enjoy putting them in crazy crazy adventures <laughs> looking at the then the team obviously every superhero team has to have some type of nemesis or superhero villains that they have to fight i mean that's kind of the the classic of the genre itself <laughs> is there a band of evil doers that they fight on occasion or from time to well, time well yes i i agree like being a Batman fan, you, you got to have a good rogues gallery. The Wonder Weenies have, it's pretty extensive now. Their first major villain was a character who's known as Beanie O'Weenie, who was the original uh, mascot for the Wonder Weenies franchise, who lost his job when Wonder Weenies decided to go in a new direction because Beanie O'Weenie was an egotistical over-the-top actor that was difficult to work with. And when he lost his job, he went insane and became this Beanie O'Weenie character full-time, became the arch nemesis for the Wonder Weenies. He's been in three or four story arcs now. But apart from Beanie O'Weenie, we have a rival fast food mascot, Waffle King, from the Waffle King franchise, inspired by the Weird Al song of the same name. He also lost his job thanks to the fact that the fast food restaurants all wanted to start superhero mascots rather than their traditional fast food mascots. He got together with a bunch of other former fast food mascots and they tried to take down the Wonder Weenies team as revenge. Uh, apart from them, uh, I have a handful of villains that I created when I was back in high school. One of the things that inspired me to become a cartoonist in high school, I did a comic based on my algebra teacher called 
Super Salstrom, his name is Mr. Salstrom. Unfortunately, he passed away last year, but he was a big fan of and very proud to be in my comics. I, I have introduced the Super Salstrom character in Wandering East. He's been a background player. Villains that were introduced, the squirrel, squirrel-themed supervillain. He has an army of squirrels at his behest. Professor Highbrow, because everybody needs a man scientist villain. A character named EMT basically was paid by an evil news organization to get some dirt on the Wonder Weenies when they went to the hospital after they first got their powers. She lost her job and became a supervillain as, as a result. Uh, currently, they are fighting almost all of the villains. I'm doing a big story arc where all the supervillains have escaped from the super jail and the Wonder Weenies said to split up and try and collect them all back up. They're also fighting the Scandinavian Mud Pack at the moment, a group of characters from Norway, Sweden, Finland, all of them. That the, the Nordic reason. The, the, originally, they were all rivals trying to get a spa to carry their country's deluxe mud. After that adventure, they decided that they'd all work together and they've created a super mud. And that super mud has mutated a former colleague of the Wonderweenies, and he's this giant mud monster that's they have to stop on top of everything. So working on that story arc right now. You definitely have a lot on your plate when it comes to the, this comic, and that's wonderful to see. I, I do love that here. As a creative person, uh, both in writing and as an artist yourself, though, what is the most important quality of, of being a creative person nowadays compared to, say, when you first started? Especially with the internet, uh, consistency is a, a big key. Like, I, I might not have the biggest readership in the world, but I, with the exception of when I was sick, I post every Tuesday and Thursday, and that's super important. Uh, people that do read your comic, you know, they, they want to know that it's going to be there. Apart from that, to be entertaining, uh, personally, I try, I do my absolute best not to be offensive while still being funny, which is not always the easiest thing to do because it's so, you know, especially when you have a title like Weenies, it's the temptation to go lowbrow is, is there. I want it to be as all audiences as possible. Not every joke is going to fly with a, you know, seven-year-old, but I want them to read it and, and still be entertained, you know, and just having those, that, those unique personalities. And that's the big thing. Like, I try not to do anything too political either. And I want my humor to be topical, but not dated. Hopefully that makes sense. Like my comic's been online for 10, 11 years now. And I would like to think that you could go back and read the early ones and they're still funny and you don't have to, you know, I'm not making too many topical jokes. Times change, especially decade to decade. And especially in today's climate in general, like humor is difficult to gauge in, the, in the best of times. Yeah. It seems even worse sometimes nowadays where you, you don't know what's considered an actual joke and what's considered offensive. It's, it's an, and I'm glad to see that you're, you're consciously making that effort, especially when you've been doing your strip for so long to keep that in mind. That's, that's wonderful to see. Not many people do that these days. Looking back at your time at the Kubert school here, what was one piece of advice that you took when you graduated that really stuck with you as a creative person? One of the earliest mistakes I made is um, one of the first commissions I took, I had no business taking. It was a portrait. They wanted it super realistic. And I was just like, oh my God, they're hiring me to do this. Oh, great. I'm, you know, awesome. But it was not a thing I was good at. Is know what you're good at. Don't bite off more than you can chew. I had no business taking that. And I almost blew the deadline. That's another important thing. Always hit your deadlines. I, you know, I've got a cartoony Bigfoot style. I'm not going to try and do a image comic not that there aren't cartoony image comics but you know that's just not what they're looking for know where you know where your strengths lie how have you strengthened your weaknesses then but if i had to label weaknesses I'll, I'll admit my backgrounds aren't the strongest what i like to do is go nuts on an establishing shot and then i might not show it much of it for the next 10 15 strips you know but with with a newspaper style strip you can you can get away with that a little bit Sometimes fall into the talking heads bit, although I do try and vary the size of my talking head so at least it's a little interesting to look at. The earlier strips are a lot more talking heads than the newer ones. I like to think that the humor carries it a bit. I just hope people give it a chance because, because I have the continuing story arc, I worry, especially with the newspaper style strip, that I might lose the audience a little bit because I love continuity. I'm a huge fan of continuity and I refer to stuff that happened 200 strips ago. I'm hoping they get the reference. If they don't, 
you know, I might, I might lose them there. Hopefully the day-to-day -day strips are still funny enough where they want to read it and know what's going to happen in this crazy scenario I have going on. Continuity has been a huge thing with comics for a long time. I certainly want to continue that with my comic strip. I don't think enough comic strips have continuity, especially daily strips. Like uh, you, your occasional comic and hop story would last a couple of weeks and there may, you know, Peanuts would have a week long story or whatever, but I really like the something like like Dick Tracy where it, it went for months and, and you just wanted to read and you wanted to know what was happening next. I really dig that. I see that a lot in today's mobile comics, like with the the apps and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. I see where you're forced in the in in technology these days, especially with vertical scrolling and everything along that. Yeah. Line, that you know you have to have a continuity, and it's amazing what they do is they'll take like the last half of the last page of their comic, and it's just a copy and paste into the next scene. And while it's a good refresher, right. It just seems like a waste of space mm -hmm. when you could just simply go back. And the same with a, a long form comic, like what you've created in general, you can still go back to see what you've missed and you can still go back into the archives and, and reread things that you might have missed, or maybe in your second read through, right. you're going to find things that you're now referencing to. Yeah. So I, I think it's more of a, a personal choice of the reader itself to actively be engaged in, in your story. You're already making it engaging. <laughs> they just have to follow through. Right, right. Oh, yeah, I, I agree totally. I, and, you know, I have other issues with, you know, modern format. Anyway, I mean, it, I feel like it forces creators into a box a little bit. If you read any of Watterson's rants about the, the restrictions newspapers used to have on, on, on their creators. It just feels like some web comics do the same thing with that vertical format and whatnot. With my, my strip, I give myself X amount of room. I might use one panel. I, I might do three panels. I usually do three or four panels. Sometimes I go nuts and I've got like nine panels, but it's all in that same format. When all you do is like four square stack on top of each, I'm not saying you can't tell a sequential story that way. It just feels so limiting to me. Sometimes the panels have borders. Sometimes they're open. It's just whatever works visually. So then looking as you've been doing this for a while now, you know, when was the first time that you learned that language had power? Oh boy. Um, well, I'd, I'd have to go back to, you know, my theater background helps a lot with that. Uh, because, because just know, because depending on how you say a thing. And, it, and it's so hard to do that in a visual medium like a comic strip because I know how I would say the line. But that doesn't mean that's the same voice in my reader's head. How, how do I write the line in such a way that my reader is going to interpret it how I'm saying it? Sometimes I have this much to say. And after I've drawn my panel... I've got that much room to say it in, and I have to figure out, okay, bust out that thesaurus. How am I going to make this make sense with, with a lot shorter words? I, I love that sort of channel. Seeing as you've been doing this comic for a while now, though, what was the first thing that you created where you thought, yes, I could do this as a career? I would say the, the second major story arc where I introduced the Beanie O'Weenie character, uh, it's still... One of my favorite story arcs. It's 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 a very funny bit. The the story elements I put in it, I originally had planned for like three or four different arcs. I just thought to myself, you know what? Let's just do all this at once. I I, I blew up the original Wonder Weenies franchise. I blew up one of the main characters and you know demonstrated that he just can't die. He just regenerates. The Beanie O'Weenie character got introduced. Another somewhat major character, El Chorizo got introduced. Everything clicked for me in that story. It was great. A second thing that I did that I thought, wow, I can, I can make this work is I did a story arc. I wanted to do like a major cosmic type villain. I was like, how would, how would this silly superhero fast food worker deal with a cosmic level villain? So I did a team up with, I made up a superhero team and had the Wonder Weenies team up with them. But halfway through that story, I, did, I didn't like the direction it was going. And I thought, how do I fix this? So I just tilted it on its head, went in a different direction. And that became another of my favorite story arcs with introduced uh, th this major cosmic villain who was changing timelines. And I brought in alternate versions of my heroes and 
sent one back in time and he spent 80 years in a pickle jar to get back to the present. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Seeing as you're a, a DC fan, you know, especially with everything that's behind you here, right. what is your kryptonite? Oh, my kryptonite. In general, I am a, I am a collector. I have a lot of stuff. I collect my Batman stuff. I collect vintage board games. I collect vintage video games. And I get a little bit obsessive about my collections and they take over. And if I ever have to move, it is a huge pain in the butt because I have to get a U-Haul just for the Batman stuff, really. Artistically, I really don't like drawing vehicles. <laughs> if, if I can figure out a way to not include a vehicle, I, I will. Uh, which is funny because the... Um, the Remedy comic I was working on with Rob, we had a huge flashback to when the main character was fighting in the Gulf War, and I had to draw so many vehicles and so many guns. <laughs> I try not to draw guns in Wonder Weenies. I, I feel that I can show cartoony, violent superheroes and villains without guns. I feel like I can do that. So I was always a little uncomfortable drawing the guns, and, and Rob's great. Rob's a good guy. He would get on my case if I didn't draw the guns right. <laughs> I remember one time I, I was drawing a sniper and I did a really good job with it, except the, the guy had it lined up, but he was, the, the, the scope was like on the wrong eye and that really bugged, that bugged Rob, but I was like, what's done is done. <laughs> so. Well, he probably had a more dominant eye on the other side. That was that. the excuse I gave him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The the history of comics spans decades, obviously, mm. and we all have our favorite styles and genres here. What was the first comic that you read that just inspired you just from not only maybe not from a, a dialogue perspective, but maybe it was a an action perspective or something along that line that you're like, wow, this is really amazing. The, the earliest comics I remember reading, uh, my grandmother had a supply of comics at one of the end tables in the, in her TV room. And this was, there were some super goofs in there and a lot of Harvey stuff, uh, Wendy, the good witch and, and Casper and things like that. Some, I don't think there was Archie stuff in there in, I read those things cover to cover and really enjoyed them. Uh, beyond that, I mean, it, it would have to be Batman. I mean, I mean, the earliest Batman stuff that really caught my attention. Back in high school, I loved, and forgive me if I mispronounce it, Brave Ogle. I loved his stuff. It was so unique and, and, and different. Huge fan of his stuff. As a kid, I would read anything I could get my hands on. I would read the cereal box over and over and over again. I would read the newspaper, mostly the comics. I, I'm a huge fan of newspaper comics. I, you know, still a little saddened that it's not as big a thing as it once was, but now we have hundreds and thousands of web comics, which is just awesome. The fact that you keep doing it, that's the main thing. You're keeping to your schedule. You're keeping consistent things that a lot of people nowadays just do in a, a batch of a book and then they release it as they go. Well, that's, that's great for one story, but to have longevity, you have to be consistent and yeah. I'm glad you're doing that. At what point are we good enough? Oh boy. There's always something to learn. There's always a new technique or, or a new approach, but that being said, you can't really agonize over a piece either because you, you got to make a deadline. Yes, my backgrounds improve over time, and there's still there's still room for them to improve, and and that just takes practice or challenging myself. Okay, you know this establishing shot has to has to be amazing, and and be proud of it, and and and, and get it out there, and and then slough off for three weeks because you've already done your establishing shot. But no, I I can't I can't. But you know, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Me personally, I, I wish that I had more electronic savvy. I'm old school. When I started in 93, we were barely using computers to do anything. We, they had just started to teach us how to color with them. My Photoshop knowledge is mired in 96. So, you know, I, I try to seek out tutorials and things uh, so my, my coloring can improve. But, you know, there are modern techniques. I, I have no idea. I wish I knew how to do more 
computer animation type stuff. I feel like Wonder Weenies will lend itself to an animation, you know, you know, but I took a year of animation. I could do it by hand, but you know, who's got time for that? No offense to those of you that, that do. <laughs> I, I'm different. <laughs> Uh, for the longest time, not only was I creating comics, like when I was doing Remedy and Wonder Weenies, uh, I was updating, you know, five different comics a week. Plus, I was working full time. It's not bad now because I, you know, I have to be on disability thanks to my kidneys. So I've got extra time, but there are days I can't do much of anything because I'm just out of it. I mean, it's a, it's a balance there. In terms of your, your technology experience when it comes to converting from analog to digital is it something where it is it a is a technology overload like do you have information overload or is it just i don't think it's an information overload because you know i love technology i grew up with with video games i, I started video games with atari 2600 i, I love oh, doodads nice. like when i was working with rob he was like oh all, all web cartoonists they all work they all use tablets they all they they all draw digitally and he lent me his tablet and I sat down there and tried to do it I was like I, I can't do this it just doesn't feel right I need you know I need my I gotta draw on a piece of paper I, I like the tactile feel that's how I do things uh scan it in it's a longer process to do than just drawing straight digitally it took me even longer to try and draw a strip completely digitally on a tablet it was like relearning how to draw it's, it was frustrating for me i'm pretty quick when it comes to drawing on paper i i still hand letter because you know, i paid good money to learn how to do that from some of the best personally i think it looks better if you're decent at lettering hand letter does it take longer heck yeah but ultimately i i like it more you know that's one fear i have is that the digital age will pass up more traditional cartoonists and you just leave it behind i mean, I mean you got to know the fundamentals and why sequential art works the way it does technology isn't going to help you do that i think it'll make it more efficient once sure. you learn the the process but like you said you're relearning the basics you're relearning the fundamentals in, in a different space so yeah. the fact that you're i think t even five years ago the disconnect or 10 years ago i should say the disconnect between drawing on a tablet versus the screen there was there was a delay there was yeah. a pretty big delay to be perfectly honest but when you have technology nowadays with faster processors ram and all that other stuff this the space of the cintiq that's a direct connection yeah. into it's it's pretty uh, just it's amazing how technology is evolving at a rapid rate when it comes to oh, being totally. creative because the virtual space, when it comes to a 3D space, VR, when it comes to creation of of anything digital, is, is pretty fucking amazing to you. Oh, oh, yeah, but without a doubt. But, I mean, there's something to be said for pen and paper, a uh, cartoony look versus hyper-realism. I mean, it's there's a reason Mickey Mouse doesn't look like a real mouse. What is one thing that everyone should experience in their lifetime? experiencing emotion rather than avoid it well maybe that's just i you know i worked in treatment centers for almost 20 years without breaking too much confidentiality i dealt with some crazy stuff i mean the kids i worked with were it wasn't summer camp they were there for some pretty extreme reasons and usually they treated emotion like bad emotions are bad and should never be experienced and avoid them at all costs and i just can't get behind that philosophy all emotions are important you know we evolved we we don't have wings we don't have claws we we don't have extreme strength but we have our brains and every emotion we developed is important suffering from depression myself avoiding difficult feelings is no good for anyone and i i, I just wish people would more normalize the bad stuff because the bad stuff sucks but it's important except the tough emotions and they're a lot easier to get past what keeps you grounded after all these years i just really enjoy entertaining i haven't been able to be on stage in a long time partially because of my you know when i work full-time and now that i'm sick i just don't have the time to do it 
comics have become the outlet for me to do that now. I like making folks entertained, making folks happy. Uh, that just keeps me going. Before I do that, is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? Not so much. I mean, if you want to talk about social media presence, I'm on Twitter, uh, Corey Remark at, at Twitter. I have a Facebook page, Cartoonist Corey Kramer. I have a Kofi, Cartoonist Corey Kramer. Same with my Instagram, although my girlfriend does the Instagram stuff. I, that technology, John, we're lucky I, I've got the Facebook and the Twitter, but she'll put stuff on the Instagram for me. <laughs> I'm hoping to get more stuff out there this year. You know, the last couple of years really have not been good. The mental stuff, I, I, I dealt with the depression. Then the kidneys failed and I had to deal with that. And of course you have COVID. It's looking doubtful. I'm going to be able to get to any conventions this year, thanks to the need to go to dialysis three times a week. I want to try and get books out. I've been toying with the idea of a Kickstarter for ages. My nephew's trying to convince me to go on Twitch or whatever and, and show my whole process mm -hmm. of how I do things. And I would like to get set up to do that. I think you should. I, 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 there's so much available to you, especially nowadays, and to showcase your your style, to showcase your your comics. I mean, people are consuming creative persons' works at, at an alarming oh, yeah. fast rate. Yeah. It is it is crazy. You could even simply, and this is just something to think about. You don't have to show your entire process. But to show segments of your process, like when you first initially ink or line or whatever, sure. and going to your final page, if you can get a minute's worth of clips of your, say, doing an entire strip, put it on TikTok. That's all you need. And yeah, honestly, TikTok's definitely a thing. <laughs> it is, but it's something that, that you see a lot of people doing. And it's just a quick scroll, but it's you're showcasing your work and your talent. You throw a link to your coffee or you throw a link to Patreon or whatever you're doing, right. and it helps you. And that's the main thing. I mean, this this show can only do so much. I can promote you on social media. I have no problem doing that. But to really showcase your, your true talents, it's unfortunately, it's it has to be in, in small bites, small chunks. Yeah. You're only one person, unfortunately, and I feel your pain. I do. Yeah. I, I want to see you do well, and you're doing extremely well. The fact that you're consistent, you have a great style, you have a great group of characters, a beautiful world that you've built. You have to be able to put yourself out there as, as much as you <laughs> digitally can. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the, you know, like I said, the technology thing, that's that's an area where I struggle. Just as COVID was hitting, I was, I was looking into possibly going back to school to get more computer stuff then my health went south and it just nagged that you know it couldn't happen so but you know I'm, I'm doing what i can at the very least i'm on update twice a week even when it, it, it was really sick you know i updated once a week i felt horrible <laughs> and, and all and my readers were all like you know dude focus on your health uh we we get it we understand but it's like i don't like missing my promised deadline Look, being a creative person is hard enough as it is, but you also have to take care of yourself. You yeah. have to, you know, take care of, of everything that occurs in, in life between what we see and what we don't see. Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on the path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I would have to say most importantly, it was uh, my late algebra teacher, Mr. Salstrom. I was doodling in his class one day. I drew him as a superhero and he saw it. And, you know, in younger years, I would get in trouble for doodling in class and not paying attention. But he he thought it was really cool, encouraged me to hang it on his board. I wound up doing a new adventure every day for the next few years. All the other teachers in the school became villains in the comic strip. And he would tell a story about a wise man. I, I'll try and tell it really quick. But, you know, as a very wise man in the olden days lived in this village and everyone would come from miles around to visit this old, this wise man and he would solve the problem. But there was one man in the village that was very jealous and felt, I'm pretty smart. Why don't, why doesn't everyone come to me? Uh, so he would try and think of a, a, a question to ask the wise man that he would not be able to answer. And time and time again, he would wait his turn and ask his question. The wise man always had the right answer. So he decided to come up with a trick question and he, he captured a small bird and his plan was he was going to hold this bird in his hands and approach the wise man and ask the wise man, hey, wise man, is this bird in my hands? Is this alive or is this dead? And if the wise man answered it was dead, well, he opened his hands and let it fly away. And if he answered it was alive, he'd 
crush it and let it fall to the ground. Either way, the wise man wouldn't have the right answer. So he waited his turn, went up to the wise man, said, wise man, this bird in my hand, is it alive or is it dead? And the wise man took a moment and replied, if you wish it to live, it will live. If you wish it to die, it will die. The power is in your hand. Mr. Salsip would tell the story the first day of class every year. It really stuck with me. I don't, I don't know if it stuck with me because of a cartoonist and I use my hands to create. I was an actor and I use my hands to gesture on stage and things like that. But that whole idea that, you know, if, if you wish your creativity and your, you need it out, you, you just got to do it. That stuck with me. And he was uh, an amazing teacher, amazing guy. Like I said, he passed away last year. He'll be missed. I'm trying to honor his legacy because he's a character in the book. From a professional standpoint, you've been creating your comic for, for many years now, and you've become successful with the variety of, of arcs and strips and books that you've created in your lifetime. You continue to be professionally successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I like to think so. I mean, obviously, it's hard to stand out in the webcomics world. There's so many of them. And, you know, my readership goes up all the time. Would I like it to be bigger? Of course I would. Everybody would like that. We're humans. We're egotistical. We want that. I'm just happy that I've been consistent. I remember when I first started this whole idea of a comic strip, it was overwhelming. The first few ideas I had, I was like, how in the heck do you make one of these every day? It, it seemed so overwhelming back then. And, and, and now I've, I've done it. I've, I've had a story arc going for 10, 11 years and I still have ideas and, and it's, I'm still having fun doing it. And that's the important bit. So in that regard, yes, I feel like I'm personally successful. I had a mental breakdown a few years ago. I'm not afraid to admit that because like I said, emotions are important. Don't avoid them. I was in a very dark place and I got past that. So I feel that's personally successful. I'm dealing with a serious health issue. Eventually, I'll get a transplant and I'll get past that. Hopefully, just bigger, bigger and better at this point. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Boy, oh boy, that, that's a good one. Because I remember the first time I majorly failed uh, was actually a joke, Hubert. I thought I was pretty hot shit, so to speak. You know, you, you come from a small town and you're the big artist in the small town and then you go to the big ocean where all the big small town artists go and, and learn how to do things. I did a piece that I, I was rather proud of, but the coloring wasn't great. And somehow I got it in my head that it was. And I remember just getting torn apart by Joe. And I felt pretty bad after that. You know, it was an important lesson learned because that's going to happen. You're, you're going to go in front of editors and and potential clients and they just might not like it they're gonna be brutally honest with you and you have to be ready for that you can't get better if you don't fail you need to learn from a mistake and take the critique and try to make that effort and if it truly doesn't apply let it fly because sometimes people are just jerks you have to be willing to listen and take a critical look at yourself and recognize, yeah, may maybe that's a weakness. Maybe that's a fault. Weakness doesn't make me a weak person. It's just an opportunity to do better. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a creative person, a cartoonist, a writer, or whatever they'd like to be creative. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think history is pretty important. It look into who inspires, what inspires you? How did they get to where they are? Don't lose sight of that. I mean, there's so many, like meme culture, for example. I struggle with meme culture. I Don't get me wrong. I've seen some memes that are very funny and I chuckle. And then I see people try and copy that same meme and do a um, hundred variations on the theme. I love a running gag. I have running gags in my comic. It becomes stale. If you've got something to contribute, contribute just because everybody laughed when they did it doesn't mean you're going to get the attention you crave when you copy it. But it's important to know why it's funny and how they got inspired and what makes them laugh and what inspires them to do it rather than be a carbon copy. I think it was Bill Watterson. He had, he had a story once about how he won an art contest by copying a Snoopy picture or something. And, and that's great. You could draw a perfect Snoopy picture, but it... Now draw Snoopy 
juggling chainsaws while on a unicycle. I mean, they already have somebody that draws Snoopy. They already have somebody that does that thing. They don't need you to draw this perfect copy of the Snoopy picture. To tell something new. Well, I do hate to say this, Corey, but that does end this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Oh. Uh, we did yeah. touch upon the social media early on here as well, too. But for those that want to support you and where to find you, where can we get that information once more? Most of my social media pre presence is on Twitter. And that's at Corey Remark. The C and the K are capitalized. Uh, my last name backwards is Remark. I think it's cool. So I incorporated that into my Twitter handle. On Facebook, I have a presence there. It is Cartoonist Corey Kramer. I believe Cartoonist Corey Kramer is also, like I said, my Instagram, my Kofi. I have links to that on, on the Facebook page. And I believe it's pinned on either my Twitter or my Facebook page as well. I hope to this year. Like I said, I, I really want to get books out this year. I, you know, I've got a few books that I was selling at conventions and things, but I, I want a bigger online presence. I got to set up a new uh, store web page for commissions and things like that. On my Kofi page, there is some information about what commissions cost and things like that. Well, you know, Corey, I, I'd love to have you back on in the future for sure, too, if you're willing to come back on. And well, sure. I, I definitely want to talk more about your ongoing series. And if you have anything else on the go, be be sure that this is a, a place where you can talk about that. So uh, Absolutely. Cool. It was a blast. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking, where... Who knows who we have next week, but I'm sure they'll be an amazing and talented creative person in their own way. In oh, you community. wouldn't have it any other way. Of course not. <laughs> Why would I be doing this for 13 years? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening watching, everyone.